Hello, everybody, and welcome to Last Week in the Church. I'm your host, John Allen, the editor of Crux, your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic journalism. We're online at cruxnow.com. This is the show where we kind of raid the journalistic fridge, take out some stories that have gone a little bit stale, sprinkle over the secret Crux brand sauce, and serve them up piping hot. Here's what we've got for you this week. First, on the road, again? Pope Francis, after recently announcing that due to his age and health issues, is going to have to travel less, has followed up, logically enough, by announcing a trip. In this case, he will be traveling to the Central Asian nation of Kazakhstan, September 13th to the 15th. We will explain why that is a particularly keenly anticipated outing. Second, coming to Kiev? The Ukraine's ambassador to the Vatican, after a private conversation with the Pope over the weekend, hints that the Pope may be making a stop in his country on his way to Kazakhstan, that is, before he gets there. We'll try to analyze why this has been such a difficult trip to get in the books, despite the fact that the Pope has repeatedly said he desperately wants to make it. Third up this week, money, 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 money! Two developments this week in the Vatican's ongoing saga of financial reform. First, the Vatican released a remarkable and remarkably honest financial statement last Friday. We'll take a look. And secondly, at the same time, the Vatican lost a legal battle in courts in the UK. And as a result, it's going to have to face the music for its relationship with a financier who is trying to clear his name in London. We'll explain what's going on there as well. Finally, this week, the Nettlesome Inns. Here's a historical rule of thumb. If the name of a country begins with the letter N, there is a good chance that at one point or another it has been a major headache for the Vatican, and right now both Nicaragua and Nigeria fit the bill. We'll explain what's going on in those two places. All that and more, and I promise you there is more, is waiting for you on Last Week in the Church, so please stick around. All right, everybody, listen, happy Tuesday to you. Happy Tuesday, August 9th in the year of our Lord, 2022. One programming note to begin this week. Next week, my wife Elise and I Elise is actually filming this video. Say hello to the nice people, Elise. Hello, nice people. See, aren't those dolce tones just the greatest thing in the world? Anyway, next week, Elise and I will be on vacation. This is the traditional getaway time in Italy. It's known as Ferragosto, the holidays of August. So we're not going to have a show next week. However, we will be back on the 23rd, Tuesday, the 23rd of August, to set the table for the Pope's big consistory, that is, the creation of new cardinals on the 27th, and then his meetings with all of the cardinals on the 29th and 30th. All right, we begin this week in the Central Asian nation of Kazakhstan. Now, beginning in the year 2003, under former President Nazarbayev in Kazakhstan, every three years, Kazakhstan has hosted what they call a Congress of World and Traditional Religions. And this is basically an interfaith summit where they bring together leaders of a variety of different religions, you know, to sort of try to do the Rodney King thing. Can't we all just get along? And it is an effort, in a way, to put a spotlight on the unique interreligious history in Kazakhstan. Now, I'm going to confess, I didn't know a whit about this history before I traveled to the country with the late Pope John Paul II in 2001. That trip came right after the Twin Towers attacks in the U.S., and so obviously the idea of Christian-Muslim conflict, the clash of civilizations, was very much in the air. Turns out Kazakhstan has a really remarkable history. The ethnic Kazakhs, that is, original inhabitants of this area, are largely Muslim. However, the country is composed of a mix of those Muslims and also Russian immigrants who were mostly Orthodox, but they're not really immigrants because most of them were originally sent to Kazakhstan during the Stalin years because they were dissidents or political prisoners or somehow ran afoul of the regime. 
Kazakhstan functioned a bit like Siberia in the Soviets. It was where you sent your prisoners to languish. So these Orthodox Christians mostly arrived in Kazakhstan in chains, where they were welcomed and cared for by the Muslims. So Muslims and Christians in Kazakhstan remember that history. There are deep bonds of friendship. In some cases, these families have intermarried. It is a remarkable oasis of Christian-Muslim goodwill in a time, of course, in which conflict between these two great monotheistic faiths has become one of the meta-narratives of the day. And so this Congress is an effort to, in a way, lift that history up and use it as a template for trying to forge friendships among world religions. Pope Francis, I mean, obviously he is a man of dialogue, particularly interfaith dialogue, in particular outreach to Islam. And so it's a natural for him in that sense. However, as interesting as all that is, that's not the real reason that the eyes of the world will be upon this trip to Kazakhstan, because it is also widely rumored that while he is in Kazakhstan, Pope Francis may have a tete-a-tete -tete with Patriarch Kirill, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church. Since the outbreak of the Russian war in Ukraine in February, the sort of dynamics between Pope Francis and Patriarch Kirill have been freighted, to say the least. On the one hand, Pope Francis is just about the only leader whose institution could loosely be described as Western, who has not outright condemned the Russian war of aggression in Ukraine or personally named Russian President Vladimir Putin as the bad guy in this story. In fact, the Pope has said there are no good guys and bad guys. All of that has been appreciated by Moscow and in a particular way by Patriarch Kirill. The, the Russian Orthodox Church has always had very tight relationships with the Kremlin and Kirill since the beginning of this conflict has in various ways sought to baptize it, that is, lend it a kind of moral and spiritual legitimacy. On the other hand, Pope Francis has also demonstrated his solidarity with Ukraine in multiple ways and has been slightly critical of the role Kirill has played, at one point saying out loud that he shouldn't be an altar boy to the Kremlin, which obviously is probably not words that, you know, cheered the heart of Kirill in his closest advisors. In any event, the Pope and Kirill have been sort of circling one another since this conflict began. They had a video call but they have not yet met face-to-face. -face. This would be their first face-to-face -face encounter since the two sat down in Havana a few years ago. And so if this meeting happens, and the assumption is that it is going to, it would be very odd if the Pope and the Patriarch were both in Kazakhstan at the same time, and they didn't at least sit down for a conversation. Assuming it happens, it will be probably the most closely scrutinized summit between two religious leaders in a very long time. And statements from both sides, both during the meeting and afterwards, will be put under a microscope to try to discern clues of which way these two leaders may be heading in terms of their thoughts about the conflict. All right, speaking of the conflict in Ukraine, that brings us to our second story this week. So over the weekend, Pope Francis in entertained in a private audience the Ukrainian ambassador to the Holy See, the Ukrainian envoy to the Vatican. And although it was private and the Vatican didn't say anything about it, either before, during, or after, actually should not have used the word either there because that involved a sequence of three items. So forgive me for that grammatical faux pas. But in any event, the Vatican was mum. However, Ambassador Yurash, after the event, was not, did not put a sock in it. In fact, he went on Twitter to say several things about this meeting. First of all, talked about how great it was and how it's always inspirational. We'll talk to the Pope, thank the Pope for being so close to Ukraine, and then said that he looks forward to greeting the Pope in Ukraine even before his trip to Kazakhstan. That seemed a fairly clear hint 
that the two men had talked about the idea of Pope Francis stopping off in Ukraine, presumably Kiev, before he heads to Kazakhstan for this religious congress. Now, here's the thing. Pope Francis, since the outbreak of this conflict, has said repeatedly that he wants to go to Ukraine. His top diplomat, British Archbishop Richard Gallagher, recently said that he could even go in August this month and that it was very much on the table. Hints have been dropped on multiple occasions that the Pope was taking a serious look at this idea. Question is, why hasn't it happened yet? Well, the answer is, first of all, at the beginning of this hint-dropping exercise, the Pope seemed to be saying that he wanted to go to Ukraine, but before he did that, he also wanted to go to Moscow, presumably to meet Putin, and potentially also Kirill in Moscow. Now, that seems to, that sine qua known, the kind of absolute requirement that the sequence had to be Moscow and then Kiev, that seems to have been softened. But the Vatican is, and the Pope personally, are still trying to do everything they can to frame this trip to Ukraine, it, when and if it happens, as not taking sides in a kind of absolute black and white sense with Ukraine against Russia. Remember that the Vatican's traditional diplomatic modus operandi when a conflict erupts is to avoid at all costs taking sides among the combatants, instead to try to remain super partis, you know, above the fray, so that in a back channel fashion, it can keep open lines of communication with everyone involved in an effort to try to improve the situation. Now that doesn't mean, let me be 100% clear, when we say the Vatican is trying to avoid taking sides, or that Francis is trying to avoid taking sides, that does not mean that Francis's or the Vatican's diagnosis is that both sides in this conflict are equally responsible for it. It may well be, that they regard the Russians as primarily responsible, but they're also concerned about the Ukrainian rush to arms, the prospect that this could become a wider global conflict and the implications of all of that. So in any event, this isn't a kind of pox on both your houses position, but instead it is a diplomatic strategy intended to keep your powder dry in public so that you can exercise leverage behind the scenes. Therefore, the Pope's concern, if he goes just to Ukraine, is that it might be framed as a kind of gesture of support for the Ukrainians and by implication, therefore, a denunciation, a statement of opposition to the Russians. Now, some of the sting would be taken out of that, of course, if immediately after going to Kiev, he encounters the head of the Russian Orthodox Church in Kazakhstan and, you know, says some nice things about Christian unity and the search for peace and all of that. But in any event, that's why this trip has been so difficult to schedule. It's easy, in a sense, for American lawmakers or the president of the European Union or European heads of state to go to Kiev. They don't have to worry about that, that gesture being misunderstood because they've already been made abundantly clear that they are on Ukraine's side and against Russia. On the other hand, if you are trying to maintain good working relationships with both sides, then the calculus becomes a lot more complicated in terms of the symbolic register. So we will see how the Pope and his Vatican team try to thread this needle. All I can tell you is that if the Pope does go to Kiev, and then goes to Kazakhstan to meet Patriarch Kirill. Ladies and gentlemen, that is going to be the hottest religious ticket of the fall. It is going to be must-see TV. We will, of course, cover it like saran wrap here at Crux. All right. Third this week, we change gears. We're talking money. I feel like I'm channeling my inner Pink Floyd here from the Dark Side of the Moon album, the famous anthem Money. Two developments this week on the money front for the Vatican. First of all, the Vatican's Secretariat for the Economy, that's a new entity in the Vatican, new department created by Pope Francis in 2014, under its new leadership, Spanish Jesuit father Guerrero, Juan Guerrero, issued 
the Vatican's most recent annual financial statement on Friday. Now, the Vatican has issued the annual financial statement since the 1970s, and to be honest with you, I don't know what to say. Most experts have largely regarded them as barely worth more than the paper they were printed on, because everyone knew that there was all sorts of financial activity in the Vatican that wasn't included in these statements. And because they weren't independently audited, that is, nobody outside the Vatican had certified that they were accurate or complete, it was hard to take them particularly seriously. However, due to reforms instituted by Pope Francis, this year's financial statement, for the first time, is, or at least purports to be, a reasonably complete picture of the Vatican's entire financial footprint. Before, there were only about 60 entities in the Vatican that were covered in the statement. This one covers a robust 92, which is pretty much every outfit that flies under the Vatican flag, with two exceptions. One is the Institute for the Works of Religion, better known as the Vatican Bank, the other is the government of the Vatican City State. That's the 108-acre island physical plant in Rome and also other papal territories in various places. They're not included because they're separate financial operations and they have separate accounting. But as far as the Vatican itself goes, this is by far the most complete and therefore the most honest financial statement we've ever seen, among other things we learned what we always suspected, which is that the Vatican's financial footprint has been badly underreported in years past. In the past, the Vatican said its annual income and expenses were around $350 million. We now know it's closer to a billion. In the past, they have said their assets amounted to about two billion. We now know it's actually more like four. And all of that in keeping with Pope Francis's pledges of transparency. And there is some good news in this financial statement. The Vatican's deficit this year, for 2021, that is, had been projected at 33 million. It actually came in around 3 million, in part due to favorable currency exchange rates, good performance on investments, mostly due to cost-cutting measures. But there is a lot of bad news, too. First, in order to achieve those savings, the Vatican is selling off about 20 to $25 million of its assets every year. Now, when you consider that its total assets is about $4 billion, do the math. It won't take long before that's all gone. And then what do they do? Secondly, the Vatican has admitted that it has significantly underfunded pension obligations that represents a kind of ticking time bomb, unless something dramatic is done. And third, there is a hospital in southern Italy founded by the legendary Capuchin mystic and healer Padre Pio that is now owned by the Vatican, that is, excuse the pun, hemorrhaging money, and nobody seems to know what to do to try to right that ship. So there are a lot of problems, but let's not lose sight of the forest for the trees. The forest is that the Vatican, for the first time, has done a reasonably thorough job of trying to come clean about what its actual financial situation is. Is the disclosure perfect? No. Is it significantly better than what we used to have? You bet it is. And that is significant in and of itself. All right, now, the other development on the money front came in the UK, where the Court of Appeal in the UK has ruled on a petition brought by Raffaele Mincioni, who was the Italian financier who was now based in the UK, who helped broker the Vatican's ill-fated $400 million land deal in London that went belly up and is now at the heart of the Vatican's own trial of the century, where Mincioni and nine other defendants, including Italian Cardinal Angelo Becciu, have been charged with graft, embezzlement, overbilling, misappropriation, basically getting caught with their hands in the cookie jar. Now, Mincioni, who has insisted from the beginning that he has done nothing wrong, had filed a petition in British courts, because this transaction took place in the UK, asking for a declaratory judgment of relief. Basically, he wants a British court to say, this guy didn't do anything wrong, and you've got to stop smearing his reputation, and you owe him money for his legal costs. Now, the Vatican had argued that sovereign immunity means they can't be judged in the courts of another country. However, 
over the weekend, the Court of Appeal held that sovereign immunity doesn't apply to commercial transactions, that commercial activity is a well-recognized exception in international law to the shield of sovereign immunity, and that basically Mincioni has every right to bring his case and to be heard in British courts, which creates the very interesting possibility that when the dust settles, even if he is convicted in the Vatican trial, whatever judgment they may try to impose against him would be unenforceable in the UK if a British court rules in his favor. So in other words, this has been a classic good news, bad news week for the Vatican on the money front. It has always been thus, and here we are again. All right, finally this week, the nettlesome ends. My theory is that if the name of a country begins with the letter N, there is a better than 50-50 chance that at some point it's going to put a B in the Vatican's bonnet. I mean, Norway, for example, even though the Protestant Reformation was a little late to get there, it was enforced more aggressively in Norway than most other places. Consider this. The Jesuits, Pope Francis' own order, weren't legally allowed back into the country of Norway until 1956, all right, 400 years after the Protestant Reformation. Or how about the Netherlands? Nowhere after Vatican II was the envelope pushed farther or faster on liberal reforms than in the Netherlands, so much so that John Paul II had to convene a special synod for the country in 1980 to try to sort things out. Nowhere on earth are Christians subject to greater persecution today than North Korea. And that brings us by a short route to two other in countries in the news this week, Nicaragua and Nigeria. In Nicaragua, the government of Sandinista leader, President Daniel Ortega, has been on a, if you'll pardon the pun, crusade against the Catholic Church for a long time. It's heated up since kind of civil uprising in 2018 against the Ortega government. Ortega has accused the Catholic Church of Nicaragua of de facto trying to engineer a coup d'etat, and most recently, over the weekend, put a Catholic bishop, Rosaldo Alvarez, in the northeastern diocese of Matagalpa, put him in effect under house arrest, basically imprisoning him in his curial residence along with some collaborators and refusing to let him leave because he had been a voice of dissent and criticism of the Ortega regime. Now, you know, by the time this video comes out, I don't know what will have happened to Alvarez. It is possible that he may actually be rotting in a Nicaraguan jail or he may have been freed. We don't know. We do know over the weekend that the Nicaraguan bishops en masse issued a statement of support and indicated they are not going to be cowed into silence. What we do know is that there's almost no place on earth right now where church-state conflict is more explicit, more overt, and more embittered than it is in the Central American nation of Nicaragua. And Alvarez is merely the latest example. Don't know what the end game is going to be. We're going to have to watch and see. Meanwhile, in Nigeria, a Catholic priest over the weekend went on Twitter to announce that in his small parish alone in the northern part of the country, north central part of the country, he has buried 18 people over the last year, 18 Catholics, who have died amidst intercommunal violence, basically conflict between largely Muslim herdsmen in this part of Nigeria and a mix of Christian and Muslim farmers. The herdsmen basically want to dislodge the farmers so they can take over their lands for grazing because the lands they used to occupy in the northern part of the country due to desert, desertification and climate change have dried up and therefore no longer contain the grasses that they need for their herds to feed themselves and water supplies are short and so forth and so on. Now, while the roots of this conflict are essentially oh, you could say basically economic, right? It's a clash over land use. Because of the Christian-Muslim divide, it quickly gets wrapped up in religion. It also gets wrapped up in ethnicity because the herdsmen tend to belong to certain tribes. The farmers tend to belong to others. And so it becomes a volatile cocktail of conflict. 
Nigeria is heading into national elections next year, 2023, and this, this spate of violence that is currently washing across the country, I mean, the estimate is that since 2018 alone, almost 10,000 people have died in these conflicts between herdsmen and farmers. Barely does a day go by without a new act of violence. The country's government is almost universally faulted for failing to guarantee security. That's going to be a lead issue in the 2023 elections. And mark my words, the Catholic hierarchy of Nicaragua is blessed with some of the most impressive ecclesiastical figures on the global scene. I mean, Bishop Matthew Kuka in Sokoto in the far north, who is a world-class intellect when it comes to the church and democracy and church-state relations. Archbishop Ignatius Kaigama in the national capital of Abuja, who is one of the most charismatic figures on the Catholic scene today. And Cardinal John Oniakin, the former Archbishop of Abuja, who is now sort of the elder statesman of the Catholic Church in the country and a classic example of a public intellectual. Those voices are not going to go silent. Nigeria, rather, stands at a crossroads. It is the most populous nation in Africa. It is the world's largest mixed Muslim and Christian society. It is critically important for global fortunes in the 21st century. And the Catholic Church boasts some of the most impressive and articulate public voices in the country. It is going to be fascinating to watch how they exercise that influence as the country heads for elections in the next year. All right, that is our show for this week. Thank you for being with us. A reminder, no show next week because Elise and I are going to be on hiatus, among other things, trying to enjoy some air conditioning amid this sweltering Roman summer heat. But we will be back Tuesday, August 23rd. Please be with us then. In the meantime, for the next fortnight, stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic and blessed two weeks, and we will talk to you again soon.